empty in the body, there is where you get all sorts of, uh, of problems. And, and cancer is, uh, uh, thrives in an acidic environment. So that's why it wants, it wants that. So you got to be very careful about those things. Okay, we are live already. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, folks. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, folks. Okay, it's already Friday. We are on a weekend, February 9, 2018. Yay! Yay! It's a weekend. Okay. So, let us uh, let us read from St. Mark. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Gospel today is from St. Mark, chapter 7, 31 to 37. So, remember, where was Jesus yesterday? Huh? Tyre. Tyre. He was in Tyre. And, uh, okay, he was in Tyre. So today he left Tyre. Okay, so there is a continuation of the gospel from yesterday, right? So Jesus left the district of Tyre and went by way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee into the district of the Decapolis. And people brought to him a deaf man who had a speech impediment and begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him off by himself away from the crowd. <clears throat> he put his finger into the man's ears and spitting touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven and groaned and said to him, Ephata, that is, be opened. And immediately the man's ears were opened. His speech impediment was removed and he spoke plainly. He ordered them not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them not to, uh, the more they proclaimed it. <laughs> they were exceedingly astonished, and they said, He has done all things well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. <clears throat> okay, there are two things I'd like to comment about this gospel. The first uh, here being, the phrase which uh, is very indicative of the way Jesus wants to deal with each and every one of us. And what is that phrase? He took him off by himself away from the crowd. So you imagine here the scene where Jesus is surrounded by many people, right? And then uh, a group of them come, come to him and say, Jesus, Jesus, please heal this man who is dumb and, uh, and deaf, right? But what does Jesus do? He does not just proclaim a, a, a word and say, Epfata, and then uh, he's healed in front of everybody, right? What does Jesus do? Jesus took him off by himself. I could imagine Jesus must have said, Okay, now, come here, buddy. <laughs> come, just you and me. Just you and me. Come on, let's go over there where nobody can see us, where maybe nobody's going to hear us. This thing is just going to be between you and me. Okay? Oh, that's right. He's deaf, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't hear, but Jesus took him, right? <laughs> Jesus took him off by himself, right? Well, of course, the expression of taking him off was like Jesus telling him, showing him by gestures <laughs> that this is just going to be between you and me, right? Okay. Funny. Yes, it's funny. Okay, so, so when they were already alone, when they were already alone, Jesus touches him, see, in his ears, touches his tongue, you see, precisely because he was deaf. <laughs> He would not know what Jesus was doing. So he needed a touch, right? He needed a physical uh, touch that Jesus uh, gave him as a symbol of cure. As a symbol of cure. Okay. That first idea, let's dwell on that. That's the way Jesus deals with each and every one of us. Okay? Jesus is not this big magician who just deals with his uh, people like uh, you know a big public 
and proclaims to them, preaches to them, and, and heals everybody or multiplies the bread for everybody to eat. No, 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 no. Jesus deals with us individually, intimately. See? He wants, he wants us personally to be acquainted with him, to have that intimacy with him, to deal with each and every one of us one on one. Okay? So let's always keep that image of Jesus in our minds every time that we pray, every time that we talk to him, every time that we that we uh, uh, have any dealings with Jesus. Remember that he wants us to do it one on one. That Jesus is not one big image of a uh, of God somewhere up there in heaven. No, Jesus is close by. Jesus is close by. And you can deal with him that way. You can talk to him on the crucifix that you may be holding while you're praying the rosary. You can deal with him, you know, look at his pictures and, and talk to him that way, one on one. When you look at that host in the Blessed Sacrament, when we make a visit to the Blessed Sacrament, that is Jesus and he is there in front of us one on one. Talk to him that way. Deal with him one on one. Okay? So Jesus wants to be a personal friend. He wants to be close and uh, close by and acquainted with us one on one. And that's the way we should deal with him. Okay? Now, second idea. You know that touching? That touching? Okay? And and because of that touching, a miracle was was performed on this on this person. Okay? The touch of Jesus is a prefiguring of the sacraments. See? What, what's the definition of the sacraments again? Oh yes, Joe. The sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Okay, it's an outward sign. A sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Jesus Christ to give us grace. Right? So, an outward sign. So there's a, there is a physical outward sign that that the sacraments use okay in order to in order to uh, uh, make us understand that the miracle happening the grace that he is giving us through the sacrament is real because because the sacraments for us are are uh, we we do not understand how the grace comes to us right it's like the dumb man then the deaf man he didn't understand what jesus was going to do to him so he needed the touch Jesus needed a touch. That is the material manifestation that there was grace being conferred on him. The grace of a miracle of hearing and talking. Now that's exactly the same thing that happens in sacraments. See? In all the seven sacraments, there are those material signs that are the manifestation that grace has come to us whenever we receive the sacraments. Okay, So that's the touch of Jesus. So let Jesus touch us through the sacraments all the time, especially when we go and receive Holy Communion, right? Now, but there is, there is a, uh, uh, another aspect to this gospel, which I want to touch on also, speaking of touch. Okay, and that is the phrase, He has done all things well. See, the people marveled at Jesus and they said, wow. This man really does all things well. Of course, you might think, well, of course he will do all things well. He was God, right? He was God and man at the same time. So you would expect that being God, he will do all things well, right? But you know, that is not what's important. That is not the important part about this phrase, okay? The important part about this phrase is that people noticed that he has done all things well. In other words, when you do things well, people notice. People get impressed that you do things well. Okay? Now, why is that important? Well, because that's what we have to imitate. We also have to do all things well, but not so much so that people will notice, but rather so that God will notice, so that God will, will notice our efforts in doing things well, 
because we want to do things for who? For God. For the greater glory and honor of God. You see, just like Jesus, he was not doing things well in order to impress people. No, he was doing it to honor God, his Father. Right? To honor his Father. To please God, the Father. So that is exactly what we need to do also. The most important audience we have in doing whatever it is we do, from our chores to our studies to our work to whatever it is we do in this world, every day of our lives, the most important audience there is, is God. God. He's the only one that matters. It is only the appreciation of God that we want to attract and nothing else. Now, if the other people around us notice it, then well and good. That way we give good example. Right? But the most important audience that we need to impress, not really because he will be impressed, but just because we want to show him that we are trying our best to become saints in every little thing we do, okay? there's only one, and that is God. Okay? So let us always do things well. The way Jesus did things well to give greater glory and honor to God. Okay, that's it for us, folks. It's time to go to Mass. We will see you next week. Have a good weekend, everybody. Next week, by the way, is already the beginning of Lent. So uh, I would encourage everybody to uh, maybe this whole weekend start thinking, start thinking, how are we going to live our Lent well? Okay, how are we going to. Uh, to uh, uh, put into practice the many virtues that uh, Lent inspires in us. And just uh, speaking of Lent, uh, you know, you hear many people asking this, these days, what are you giving up for Lent? Hmm. You know, while it's nice to be giving up something for Lent, many times I would encourage the opposite. Instead of giving up, what will you gain during Lent? What will you gain? You know why, why I prefer that? Why I prefer gaining something rather than giving up something? It's because when I say gain, I refer to gaining in virtue. Because when you, when you have a, a more positive approach to, to uh, the whole essence of Lent, when you try to gain a virtue, you gain it by sacrifice. You gain it by giving up your bad tendencies. You gain a virtue by giving up vice. See? So it's really a more uh, positive approach to Lent. It's really more like you're giving yourself a goal to attain, which is attaining a virtue rather than just giving up chocolates or giving up sweets or giving up candy. That's easy. That's chicken feed. But what did you gain by doing that? It's okay to give up chocolates or to give up things, but attach it to gaining a virtue. Virtue, virtue, folks, is what makes us saints. It is sanctity that we desire. It is sanctity we have to try to uh, achieve in this life. And Lent gives us that opportunity. So let us... Focus on gaining virtue rather than just giving up chocolates. Funny. <laughs> okay. We'll see you next week, folks. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.